The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Don't adjust your screen. There is nothing wrong. You are about to enter a world where the very concept of time is rendered obsolete by the sheer power of entertainment. You're about to enter the Bogus Hour. And welcome to this episode of the Bogus Hour. Tonight, my guest is one of the original Boston comedians during the comedy boom. He's traveled the country. He's been on A&E. He's here in Nashua on the Bogus Hour tonight. My good friend, Bill Campbell. Woo-hoo! Uh, I love her dearly, but we have our differences. One thing she does drives me nuts. My wife hates throwing stuff out. So her solution is every summer, Bill, let's have a yard sale. <laughs> oh, these are torture. Here's my definition of a yard sale. Take all the stuff I wish we could throw away. Put it on the front lawn, sit with it all day, put it back in the house. <laughs> and what a wonderful day it is. <laughs> but it's worth it, because we made that extra $30. <laughs> I hate these things. If that's about what I'd like to do with the neighbors, let's have a multi-family yard sale. So all the neighbors bring their trash my front lawn. We sit with the junk all day long, then my wife buys stuff from them, and we put more back in the house. <laughs> I lose money and I put more stuff every year. But that's not the worst part. The worst part is some of the people that come to these yard sales. These are the cheapest people on the planet. First of all, they show up at like 5.30 in the morning, you know? Am I early, you know? Yeah, it's 5.30. Well, I want to get it early, you know. How much is that? It's a dollar. I'll give you 50 cents. <laughs> Just take it. <laughs> yeah, you cheap son of a gun. You can have it. You see that woman over there? When she turns her back, take the whole kid and caboodle. <laughs> You're the lucky winner. I've been trying to get rid of this stuff for 20 years. <laughs> You know, it's weird, if it's free, they don't want it. Ah, oh, free must not be worth nothing. <laughs> but that dollar iron for 50 cents, that's a hell of a deal, boy. You gotta go 5.30, so don't miss that, baby, you know? And we just saw a little stand-up comedy from my guest tonight, comedian, longtime uh, Boston comedy veteran, Bill Campbell. I hope they laughed. <laughs> well, welcome to the Bogus Hour, Bill. It's Thanks, good to see Greg. you. Thanks, Greg. Nice to be here. Nice yeah. to see you again. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, you in, we worked together many times. Many times past. over the years. Every dump we can find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, road trips and to Maine and all those other places. So why don't you tell me, you know, where you, you know, how you grew up. My story? Where you're from. Yeah, give me the I got a long story. story. <laughs> I'm an old guy. Actually, I grew up in the south side of Chicago. Oh, okay. Irish Catholic urban area. Uh, That's uh, the, the the place that Leroy uh, Brown came yeah, from, Yeah, bad, right? bad Leroy Brown. He was, was a lot better than me. I was not bad. <laughs> You're a I good was Catholic, the Richard yeah. Pryor version of make him laugh so you don't have to fight. <laughs> I didn't do as good as Richard Pryor, but, right. but I was a funny guy. Nice. And, and uh, you know, big families everywhere, big Irish Catholic families. You know, across the street, the woman was pregnant 10 years in a row. <laughs> Eight girls lost oh, two. I mean, this was... Sure. standard in my neighborhood sure. but me i just me and my sister my mother was a school teacher my father worked for the government and uh my parents were older my sister was eight years older so i was like oh there was eight year gap between the two yeah wow. so i was the young end of life kind of baby that pops in hey so my parents passed away in like the 80s and uh, I got out. Of, I went to Marquette and got out of college. And, and what'd you get your degree in? I have an engineering degree. Ah, okay. I was good at math, but I was a terrible engineer. Oh, no kidding. I, I couldn't. 
I, I cannot fix nothing. <laughs> and I never have. Why would you go into engineering? I was good at math, so they told me, it's a good thing to do. Well, what's a stupid thing to do? <laughs> so I got out of college, and I came out. I just had to get away from home. So I came to Boston, and I was teaching. I was going to be a teacher. And I had all the math and the science. And so I was a teacher, and... Uh, in what I was time? never any good at engineering, so I figured I was taught in the city of Boston. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I taught there for oh, eight or nine years, and in the course of doing that, so I started doing that comedy. the 70s? Yeah, it's the yeah. 70s. Boston and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, Boston was a, was a uh, so hotbed of... Uh, I think I started doing comedy in the mid-70s. So and that, in those days, and that there was... was no, there was no comedy clubs. There was nowhere to do it. You went to like Hooten, Hoots, open Hoots with folk singers and stuff, you know, right. the Sword and the Stone downtown. And there wasn't any place to do it. There was no comedy clubs. Did you do like the Combat Zone stuff too? Uh, I didn't do that. <laughs> I, I did Lenny's on the Turnpike. I think, I think uh, Leno did that. Oh, okay. But I didn't. But know, there was, yeah, there was no comedy club, so to was, speak. Right? I remember doing the Playboy Club. They had an open mic at the Playboy Club. Really? Like the midnight show, the comic must not want to do a midnight show, so he offered the young comics open mic kind of thing for the midnight show. And I met Teddy Bergeron, Teddy Bergeron. and John Rourke. He's a name from the past that oh, was yeah. on uh, he went, Fridays. Like, he and went on Fridays, right. He's an impressionist. Teddy and him, and there's a couple others I met there. I had long hair at the time. And oh, yeah. Blue jeans with holes in them. I was quite the hippie. <laughs> and, uh, you know... I did okay. Teddy told me I should take stuff out of Mad Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even have a clue back then. He was funny, though. He was funny. He was funny. He was still Teddy. <laughs> but anyway, that's a whole other story. That's so uh, funny. But uh, then, you know, I would do it, and then I would do okay, and then I would bomb, and i go, oh, this is not for me. I, I remember going to New York in that time period. I was really new. Like, I'll go to New York and get discovered. I had no idea how this worked. I'd go to New York and get discovered. So I, I, I heard about uh, the improv and Catch a Rising Star. I think I went to the improv and put my name. I, I told me to start at 10 o'clock, Monday night, 10 o'clock. So I take the bus from Boston. I get to the improv in New York. I'm like quarter to 10. It's a big line. <laughs> guy's got a legal pad He's on the, every line. The third page, uh, <laughs> three ways on, uh, and my name goes on. Oh. So that's, well, I go in, I'm sitting in the back. That's 40 people and, in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they put all these comics on. I think, well, geez, when am I going to get on? It's like 10, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. <laughs> then about 12 o'clock or 12.15, the regulars come in, and they did the show till like 1 o'clock or 1.30. Holy smokes. And then most of the crowd left. I got on it. 3.30, <laughs> somewhere between 3.30. Oh, my and God. And the people that were in the club, they are in the back partying. <laughs> and there was, like, four people in the audience, two of them and the other comics, that are after me. <laughs> Needless to say, I totally bombed. <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, well, what can you do, I, right? I know. As I get on the bus, totally depressed. What am I doing? This is <laughs> how stupid. What an idiot you are, you know. So I was pretty depressed about the whole thing. And then in 1980... And that's when the Boston the comedy... comedy 78, 78, the comedy yeah. connection started. Barkley and Bill Downs. And I was on the first night. And that's the old Charles Playhouse. Yeah. Warren and that State. was the beginning of, uh, you know, we all got a few minutes. We all knew, kind of like... I met Donovan. I had met Donovan before. Yeah. Mike Donovan and, and Don Gab. And some, some of us start started doing this and it wasn't getting many people it looked like it wasn't going to go like all of it in those days and then uh this guy named steve morris used to write for the globe I remember the he name. came in and did a review and it put it in the calendar section i was reviewed donovan was viewed downs and barkley you know they used to start the show like i'm paul barkley i'm bill downs now you've made the comedy connection <laughs> but anyway that review, it wasn't a great review, but it was pretty good. The next week, uh, this is a Wednesday night. Yeah. The next week, around the corner. Packed. Right. And that was the beginning of about a, 
and this is probably 78, maybe a nine or 10 year run right. where it just skyrocketed and the people were coming. I guess the baby boomers were <laughs> still at their singles age or something. Sure, my connection to it was I lived in Milford. The next town over was Amherst, was the Amherst Country Club. Yeah. So I did my that many times. 16th birthday in 82, my folks took me there. And then I went. Who'd you see? Remember? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I should. I did that with Goldthwaite. Yeah, I should bring. I should. I did that with I've got uh, a Judy notebook. Tenuta. Yeah, see, I remember yeah. seeing. You know, I remember seeing Dana Gould was just an opener kid. Noxie was a skinny middler kid. Um, Leary, uh, uh, yeah. Barry Crimmins, uh, Sweeney, uh, Kevin Meany, all the time. Yeah. Sometimes they would do like at the end of the show. They would then do another like 15, 20 minutes of improv after the show. Um, so all of those, you know, all of I those did guys. That. I remember Ford. doing the Amherst Country Club with Goldthwaite, and he used to be this kind of, I mean, I had this wild character, you know. And when there was a bad heckler, and the heckler's screaming at everybody, everybody's complaining. And Goldthwaite used to do this thing with heckler, where he'd be in the character, and he'd go, you know, a funny guy. I met a funny guy that was heckling one time, and I knifed him. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked right at the guy, like. <laughs> <laughs> the guy didn't know. If you really might knife them. Right, right. <laughs> Shut up. The whole rest of the show. It was great. I loved it. So that was, you know, that was literally the next town over that. this incredibly hot room. Yeah. So I actually was, you know, you know. That it was, was like a weekday night. Or it was something. a Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah Wednesday. it was a Wednesday yeah. night. And that was, yeah, probably up until about 87 or 88. That period, I mean, you just put a mic in a pizza place and never, I mean, the right. people just, and it wasn't just Boston. Boston. And San Francisco were the two that really took off. Yeah. But it was happening everywhere. All over the country. It was happening. All, it was very exciting. And for a comedian, you know, uh, the crowds were great, Greg. Right. They were like, at the Ding Ho, we would do, it was so popular at one point, and, and no one was a star yet. So everybody did the same amount of time. In fact, you get a little more money if you hosted. Ah, okay. So it'd be three comics and a host. And the host would get everybody get the same amount of money, and the host would get a little more because he had to go up more often. Right, it was right. strictly even because no one had reached any pinnacle at the time. Right. On the weekends, anyway. And uh, the crowds would come. So the Ding Ho had a room in the front, and they had a restaurant. Yeah. And there was a, a a bar kind of thing between a a, rest, a kitchen. So it, we we did we would do. Six shows wow. on a Saturday night, oh, and you go back and forth. You do a set in one, and you go through the kitchen, and to be the guy, the Chinese guy that didn't speak English, oh, yo, not the show. <laughs> we go through, we do the other room, then you go back and do the other room. Wow. And the crowds were, it was packed. It was, it was, it was Steve Rice to call it the Woodstock of comedy. Because <laughs> it was just all of a sudden, it was a, we, we, we didn't know anything about it. It was very exciting. Right. For the comedians. Were, right, it was something that was happening, you're, you're literally. Yeah, and it was so much fun to perform because the crowds had so much energy. Right. You know? So anybody that talked about that time that was there. Like and it's funny because I never, I never Donovan, did go to the Ding Hall. But I, I, but I did go to the Charles Comedy Playhouse. Comedy was good, too. Comedy yeah, the Comedy Connection was, was, was a great And movie. when it really was grown, there was the Comedy Connection. There was Knicks. There was Catch a Rising Star. There was Played Against Sam's. There was seven, eight clubs doing right two or three shows on a Saturday right night. Right downtown. I remember working at, at uh, Sam's and Stitches. They're both on Commonwealth Avenue. Doing three shows at one, going up three. You do a show here, drive up, do a show, come. <laughs> but a sixth show... You I mean, you weren't making a lot of money because like 50 or 60 bucks a set. It wasn't like now where right, you, get, right. you get small, but you did a lot of shows. By the sixth show, you would go, you, you, you do it, and if you didn't go laugh, you go, did I already say that? <laughs> <laughs> You're not laughing because right. I did it? Yeah, no, I mean, we I, didn't hear that. Good, because I can't remember right, what I've been saying. Right. I've had just even doing two shows, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I think I've already done that setup before. But I can imagine doing like three shows or four shows or five shows. It was so popular. And, and they were packed. Right. It wasn't like the late show had 10 people or right. anything. Well, you know, that didn't last. First of all, more money came. Yeah. And it got on cable and it got spread out. And, and people wanted to make more money, and rightfully so, you know. 
gradually things change. So it so as as this is now taking off, then what what year did you do the uh, uh, like the evening at the Improv or Comics on the Road? It's about at the end of the boom of so, the real heavy. Yeah, the boom didn't die like this. Right, kind of petered out, tapered off, and people moved and clubs closed. Yeah. Like the Ding Ho was a really good club, and you went there one time, closed up. <laughs> it was wow. It was packed every weekend, but the guy was gambling. Oh yeah, and so. Well. The money all went. They yeah, closed. which is always one of the things, you know, a lot of these rooms are predicated on the whims the of the owner. And, and some He didn't care about comedy. He was going to the track <laughs> with all the money, and it was gone. And they just wow. locked it up one night. So it was a real That was lot. it. Quite a so that was the end of that one. Ignominious The Comedy ending. Connection moved to Fano Hall to go to the big club. Right. And, uh, which, it was still a good room, but it did not have that. Electricity that the, the Charles Playhouse had. It just yeah, there's always some growth, more money for some people, less right. money for others. Competition, you know, it 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 never stays the same. It's sure. always changing. Yeah. But around 1990 or 88, 90, I did evening at the Improv and comedy on the road and every, but there was so many cable shows. I mean, I'm not saying I'm a bad actor, <laughs> but lots of people got these shows because. <laughs> You can see this, it was a groundswell of comedy, so TV, and then all of a sudden there's cable shows. They got to fill all these cable yeah. shows, cable stations. Sure, sure, yeah. And so they were throwing stand ups, and they were looking for stand ups. So if you had any kind of an act that was reasonable, you got some kind of that, you know, just to fill the right. TV time. Right. So I was part of it. I did a little of that, you know. And then I started going on the road more because I was going to. Uh, I had been teaching, and then I, I, I stopped teaching. I was doing teaching part time to do more comedy, so I was going on the road a little bit. Yeah. So I started working in road New England. Gigs. You know, yep. gradually the the spheres start to move out. Right. So I, I did a fair amount of road work. What were some of your night. favorite uh, road road places? I did a lot in Pennsylvania. Yeah. I like the Pennsylvania crowd. It's a big state. You don't realize until you start driving through it how Huge big of a state it is, you know? I mean, I tend to like the eastern part of the state. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, but the, as opposed to Philly, the Pennsylvania. I mean, Philly has Boston type rough edge type sure. sports fans and their comedy right. like that too, but they like it. Like, right. they're like Boston crowds where when they're with you, they really, really give it to you. you. So it makes you feel good. I, I did a lot of work in Philly, I, I'm outside Philly in the. It was clubs in the suburbs of Philly, and I did Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. But I did not like Long Island. I, oh, really? <laughs> Long yeah. Island is like, you know, they like to come. They dress a little, and they like to come, and, t and they think they're something. Right. So, right. you know, if you don't please them and their buddies, they <laughs> Long Island could be tough. There was a club on Long Island called Chuckles. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that did this many times. Named after and I the remember, bad candy. It sticks in my head because I remember driving. It's on Long Island, so I'm driving. It's a weekend job. Yeah. I'm driving on Friday. Got the radio on. And Leno and the Leno Letterman fight's going on. Oh, yeah. You remember that? Sure, Where sure. They're mad at each other. Who's going to get the Tonight Show? And Leno, in an interview, says, well, you know, you don't have to feel sorry for me. It's not like I'm spending the weekend at Chuckles or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one spending the weekend at Chuckles. Thank you, Jay. I know you're not, because I uh, am. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So when, when you started, you do you remember working, did you work with Jay at all? Or was he already? He, he was already. Kind of on the road kind of a guy. He was established right. as a good, he is a great stand-up comedian. He right. was a great stand-up comedian back then, right. before he ever got to the right. Well, I, I he, think he, went, he came to Catch a Rising Star before it was Catch a Rising Star. Maybe it was Jonathan Swift or something. He came and did like an hour, and we all went and watched Ooh, him. Wow. And he was just... Right. He would do his whole act. He would do 45, 50 minutes, and then he'd just take questions from the crowd do another half hour. Wow. He well, was, that was, he was I mean, always a very talented. Right, step. that was how he got the Tonight Show. Is that well, I remember seeing him, you know, watching him with my family, and when he would come and do a do a set on the Tonight Show, it was a it was a killer set. He was a funny dude, and you can see that's you know. Jay Leno is ten times the stand-up comedian David Letterman ever right. would think of being, right. but right. he's not as good on TV maybe right. as Letterman. I don't know. That's for other people to judge. Sure, 
but as a stand-up, right. with the craft of being a stand-up. Jay Leno's one of the best. Jay Leno's really good. Very talented guy. And he looks, he makes it look so easy. You think it's yeah, just, he's, he's, you think he, he's just being a happy-go-lucky Jay, but no, he's a... He knows what he's doing. Yeah, he knows what he's, at least my opinion, he does. But, uh, no, I never worked with him. A lot of people did, though, because yeah. he was doing the clubs everywhere. And uh, I did work with a lot of guys. I worked with Bill Maher. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Very short. Yeah, I know it's so Very funny. Very short. You, you see people on TV. And he's, yeah, he was really to nice tell. to me. So I ain't, I ain't complaining. He was good. He treated me with respect. So I ain't got no beef. But he was a jerk. I mean, he could be a jerk. Yeah. I, I watched him. You know. Tough. Yeah, he, I actually. He was nice to me. Nice I to me. actually auditioned for his show. It was back when it was on ABC. I think it was at eleven eleven thirty, after or twelve o'clock. I think after the Nightline. It was politically incorrect back then, and they were looking. They they would do like a citizen panelist. Yeah. So I went. I can't remember it somewhere, Waltham or Framingham or something like that. And they actually had it in a mall, and you sat down and and would you know try to pitch. He had an interesting idea. So he had utmost count on stage. He did something or didn't laugh. He would not think twice about saying it's the crowd's fault. Right. That was funny. Hell. <laughs> Other words. Yeah, and, and he still does that. I mean, he's still on his, on his HBO show. He's still his, his extreme confidence that yeah. I never had. I'll tell you that one. <laughs> They're not laughing. I'm panicking. <laughs> but uh, there's a guy who worked for him for many years that was around here named Billy Martin. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Who was a really nice guy. Great guy. And he worked hard at writing jokes for Leno and everything. Sure. And I'm happy for his success. He was a good guy. Yeah, he. I think he's looking That's how good. I feel about people that I know now. If they're really successful, like he's successful. Right. Someone like, there's a lot of people I know that have gone much more successful than me. And there's two reactions. One is, oh, baby, man, what a good guy. I'm so happy for him. And right. the other is, that jerk. <laughs> Please don't tell me about him, would you? I really don't want to hear how he's hear about doing. his success. Because he's such an idiot. You know, my opinion, he's not a nice person. Right. I really don't want to hear how good he's doing and how wonderful <laughs> he is. You know, the other people don't know. Oh, don't you? Do you know so-and-so? And you go, yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> You're lucky you don't know. <laughs> I interviewed Dwayne Perkins uh, last year. That's a nice guy. You know, no, one of the nicest guys guy. in the world. Funny, you know? too. Yeah, very, funny. very, very funny. He very was funny. here when he was really starting. Yeah. I worked with him a couple of times. Yeah, very, very. One of these guys, you look and you go, he's new, but he's, he's good. good. Yeah, he's, he's good. good. Yeah. And he did. He just Plus, really, he was really nice. Very, extremely yeah. nice, yeah. He's a, a, one of those guys you're like, like almost like too nice to be a comedian. <laughs> He's done pretty good. He's done, yeah, he's done quite well. Good for him. So, let's see, I wanted to ask you about Open for the Pousset Dart Band. They're a classic. Yeah, classic kind I, was, of, uh, I opened for some bands back in the 90s, and a lot of times it would be uh, the colleges. Oh, yeah. That was at BC, and I opened for, and then there was uh, there was some rock and roll clubs in Boston that we used to, I opened for the Scott Heron. Oh, really? Up for Garland Jeffries. Oh. You know? I remember going to Gil Scott Heron, who young people watch us don't know who that right. is. Right, he just, I think, just passed he just away passed last away, year. Yeah. But he was a very nice man to me. And right. I, 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 he goes, hey, going on first? I go, yeah. I go, I go, I'm just a local guy. And he said, uh, we all were just local guys. <laughs> Revolution will not be televised. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and uh, as we... But opening for bands is hard. Sure. So, you know, I did one open for Roy Orbison, one of the worst shows I've ever had. Oh, no kidding. I was like, you know, they put on some band before me. They so were, they get they the dragged, volume level up to here. Oh, no, they dragged the show off. As Roy Orbison was going to be on. He was just making a comeback or something. So they put this, the show was at 8 o'clock. They put a band on for an hour. Then they put a break. I mean, I got on like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Oh. And the people have been drinking and waiting for like three hours or two hours. Oh, and and it was a big rock and roll stage. Like, no comedian, Bill Campbell. You know, it's all dark. And you hit the stage, and every part of the place, people were yelling at me, get out of here, we're <laughs> Orbison. <laughs> we're, <laughs> I mean, not one person. Yeah. Hundreds of people screaming right. at me. <laughs> yeah, I've always found that, that comedy and music are a really tough mix, unless it's, you know, unless it's done really, really skillfully. It's just... 
It, it can be okay. It can be. But I mean, I more did, I did one, of those, one of those things in a round where the oh, stage right. goes around and open it for Dion. Oh, man. You know, and that crowd was nice, but, you know, it's just not set up for comedy. I mean, they're laughing, but I'm going, oh, gee, <laughs> what am go? I talking to now? Go? I have to, <laughs> to keep my balance. <laughs> it's not the usual comedy. Right, man. right. Anyway. And you've done a one-man show? I have a one-man show I've done for the last... 10 years when I can get it. Yep. I like it. It's about raising my kids. I have three kids and they're all grown now. And uh, I was doing a lot of stand up around raising children. Right. And some of it I couldn't really do as what you to stand up. You know, they want you to pound. Sure, sure. As so, opposed to storytelling. So I put this more as a storytelling. I like doing it. I don't get asked to do it as often right. as I like, but I have done it in theaters yes. around New England. I did some fringe. Oh, fringe yeah. festivals yeah. up in Minnesota. I did the Fringe Festival there. I like it. I wish I could convince other people to like it. Right, right. <laughs> so right. I could do it more often. Yeah. But it's got serious tones to my opinion about parenting and my different struggles, which I don't have to go into here. <laughs> but let's, let's put it this way. Anybody who's raised kids, you know, sure. you have your problems. Mine are doing well now, but in the course of the teenage years, there was oh, yeah, that's a lot of work. struggles. That's why I never had any. Yeah. <laughs> And then finally, your TV show that you've done, Campbell's Comedy Corner. I've had this cable show like this uh, in front of an audience for about uh, 20 years. So I'm going to go through my archives and dig up a clip of me on your show. So It's fun. Yeah. I remember yeah, having it. was a great time. It was a nice Good. nice little crowd and nice, uh, nice setup. The people at the station are very nice. And nice. So. As they are here, the, the exemplary here. <laughs> uh, this has really been a really fun little. Yeah, it's Street nice. Gear, Very so. comfortable. Just yeah. talking. Don't have to make anybody laugh at exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no crowd to play to. <laughs> so that's been your, uh, your time flies on the bogus hour. And that's it, huh? We've gone through the uh, obligatory amount of time, and we are now at the closing of the show. So I'd like to thank my friend Bill Campbell for coming on the show. My and pleasure, Greg. For him online. I think we'll be running the information for him online. And you can come and see him at a uh, comedy club in the area. Or if you're having a fundraiser and you need somebody, I'm always looking for work. <laughs> you! Look at my website. Bill thanks, Campbell, Greg. thanks for coming on. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on The Bogus Hour, email us here at thebogushour at gmail.com. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.